Hello everybody, my name is Adrian Gowdy and in this lecture we're going to talk about the artefacts that you will see and use in lung ultrasound. So first, to just briefly recap the basic principles of ultrasound, what the machine does is sends out a pulse of sound and that comes from the transducer. That pulse of sound hits an object and bounces back. It's all very simple. We see here diagrammatically, this is the transducer, this is the object, and we see a wave front, the pulse of sound sent out. It travels through the tissue, it does lose a little bit of energy as it does that. But when it hits the surface of the object, some of that energy is reflected back. The rest of that energy will continue to travel through, and then will hit the back part of the object, that reflection from the front is already travelling back towards the transducer. And so the returning sound impulse, when it then hits the, re the transducer, is registered. It is converted into an electrical signal that's sent to the machine. The machine processes that and then puts a blip onto the screen. So here again, we have the original pulse that's been emitted. We have the reflection that came from the front of the object, a reflection from the back of the object. They then travel back towards the transducer. When the first returning signal hits the transducer, the machine puts a blip on the screen. A moment later, the second returning impulse hits the transducer. The machine puts a second blip on the screen. And so what this gives us in summary is a pulse of sound that is emitted by the transducer along what we call the beam line. That pulse travels through the tissue, loses a bit of energy on the way, we call it attenuation. It hits an object where some of it's reflected, most of it generally travels through. It then travels, that reflective wave travels back through the tissue, gets attenuated a little bit more, back to the transducer. The transducer then converts the energy into an electrical signal, which is processed, and the machine puts a blip on the screen. The time taken for the returning signal then determines how far down the screen the machine puts the blip and the direction of the beam determines where the blip is, is placed. The strength of the returning signal determines the brightness of the blip. And this essentially is how an ultrasound machine works and that all sounds very simple. But there are some implicit assumptions that the machine makes when it does this process. It assumes that the pulses travel in straight lines and that pulse goes directly from the transducer to the object, it then reflects from the object and travels straight back to the transducer. The machine assumes that the sound waves travel at a constant speed and that is how it can determine how far an object is from the transducer by measuring the time taken for the pulse to travel to the object and back. The machine also assumes that all the returning echoes that it receives arise from the centre of the sound beam, or alternatively, it, the other way of thinking about that is it assumes that the beam is very narrow. And finally, the machine will assume that the sound wave is attenuated at a uniform rate as it travels through the tissue. Okay, so this is all very fascinating and if you want to build an ultrasound machine you've got to understand that, but does it have any relevance for us, the users of the machine? Well, if these assumptions are violated then we will get artefacts. And this destroys one of the things that we usually really like about ultrasound. Ultrasound is very visual. We can look at the picture on the screen and it doesn't take too much imagination to picture the actual anatomy or even the pathology that's occurring inside the body. If we see the lump, a lump on the kidney, if it's uniformly black with a thin regular border, then we can easily imagine a simple cyst being there. But if we see a lump that has echoes within it, then we start picturing a solid mass or something that may be potentially more sinister. But if we have artefacts present, then they 
can interfere with that relationship because an artifact is when we see something on the screen that doesn't actually reflect what's happening there in the body. So normally they're a problem and we don't like them. However, there are some artifacts that can be diagnostic. For example, when you look at a gallstone and you see the bright front edge, but you see the very clean cut shadowing behind it, then again, we can imagine a solid object. And so it's not too great a stretch of the imagination to look at that and say, ah, well, that's a gallstone. But if we think about what we're doing, we're using those artifacts as a diagnostic criteria. Now in lung ultrasound, it's mostly about interpreting the artifacts. So what we're going to do is we're going to briefly run through the basis of some of these artifacts. Then we're going to talk about some of the specific artifacts we get in lung ultrasound. And then in the later lectures and in the practical sessions, we'll put that together into interpreting the pathology that may be present. So the first artifact I want to talk about is called shadowing. And this is a type of attenuation artifact. And this occurs when all of the sound energy is either reflected or absorbed at an interface. And as a result, none of the ultrasound energy can penetrate beyond that interface. Now, particularly in lung, this occurs at the air tissue interface between the soft tissue, for example, of this chest wall, and the air-filled lung. And that's because of the large difference in acoustic impedance between air and tissue. And as a result of that very large difference in what we call acoustic impedance, virtually all of the sound energy is reflected at that interface. So here we have, this is taken from the left chest of a patient. And here we actually have a rib and bone. Now we get shadowing behind a bone because the energy is actually absorbed here. Here is the pleural surface, and so here we have the lung. And so at this interface here, virtually all the energy is reflected back. So both of these interfaces, tissue bone and tissue lung, will cause shadowing. However, you might notice that this is a darker sort of shadowing, and this has got some brightish echoes behind it. So if all of the energy is reflected back, why isn't this a neat black area? Well, we're going to talk about some of the other artifacts that will create this image here and the difference between what happens at an air tissue interface and a bone tissue interface. So moving on through the different types of artifacts, I want to talk next about a mirror image artifact. Now, as we said, one of the assumptions the machine makes is that the beam travels directly from the transducer to an object and back. But in this case, the ultrasound beam hits a strong reflector and is directed in another direction, just like you see light bouncing off a mirror. And so as a result, objects that are present on one side of a strong reflector are actually shown to be present on the other side. Now, one of the things to bear in mind is that if you can see the object on both sides of the reflector, then it can be very simple to look at it and say, ah, oh, well, that is a mirror image artifact. But if the mirroring surface is at a funny angle, because your beam is quite narrow or you're only seeing in one plane, you might not actually see the object that is causing the mirror image artifact. So let's have a look at a diagram because it makes it a little bit simpler. Here is the transducer. It sends out energy here. It hits the reflector. This is, for example, the diaphragm. The sound bounces back at this angle, hits an object, bounces back, and then goes back to the transducer. The machine, however, doesn't recognize that that reflection has occurred here. Instead, it assumes that that ultrasound pulse has gone straight down, so there must be an object there. And so it will put an object on the screen 
here. And as I said, you may or may not see this object depending on the plane of your beam. If your beam plane shows the entire diaphragm here and shows this object, well then it's very easy to pick. But if you imagine if that plane is at 90 degrees and so running in and out of the screen, then you won't actually see this object here. So here is an example. This is liver. This is the diaphragm. And here we see this is all mirror artifact coming from the liver. We don't normally see liver above the diaphragm, except in some unusual pathologies. And so usually it's quite simple to look at this and say, ah, oh, well, we know that this is a mirror artifact. But this occurs at any strong reflector, such as the diaphragm, but also at an air tissue interface. Now the next artifact is what's called a reverberation artifact. And this is again a beam path artifact. And in this case, the beam bounces back and forward between the probe and the reflective layer, or it can bounce back and forth between two separate reflective layers. And once again, the machine assumes a straight line path, and that is deviated in this case. So the machine will place equally spaced bands on the screen. So let's just have a look at that as a diagram because it makes it a little simpler. Here we have the transducer, and here we have a reflective surface. We send out a pulse, it hits the surface, it bounces back, the machine puts a line on the screen. That's all very simple. But that impulse, when it hits the transducer surface, can then actually bounce back off the transducer surface, go back down, hit the reflective surface again, and then come back up. And once again, comes back up to the transducer and will cause another impulse to be registered. But the machine won't recognise that that is the same impulse coming back a second time. It will assume, because it's taken twice as long, that it's just gone down, hit another surface down here, and come back. And so the machine will put a second band on the screen. And it will do the same, and it will put a third band. Now these will generally get weaker as you go down, but what you'll get is these series of bands on the screen. A variation of that is when you have two reflective surfaces here and the impulse comes down and then bounces back and forward between them. And every time it hits this interface, some of the energy bounces back, but some will go back to the transducer. And so once again, you'll get equally spaced lines put on the screen. Now this is a very, very common artifact in lung because we have the reflective surface of the pleural line. And this is what creates, or sorry, this creates what are called A-lines, which are one of the fundamental ultrasound features of lung. Here we have the pleural line here. And behind that we see we have these bright white lines. And most of these, if we look at the spacing from here to here, and it's about the same as here to here, and this is one of the fascial planes of the intercostal muscles. So the beam has come down, it's hitting here, it's bouncing back and forward here, and every time it does, it shoots a bit of energy back to the transducer. And we get these parallel A-lines. We also get a few fainter ones from some of these other little surfaces in here. And so that's called a reverberation artifact. Ring down artifact actually is used to describe two different situations. The classic situation is where you have a metallic object and it's thought that the ultrasound beam makes the metal start to vibrate. And so this is generally considered a resonance phenomenon. As the object vibrates, it emits sound waves back to the transducer. And so you get a series of closely spaced parallel lines. Here, for example, this is a metallic intrauterine device. And here we have lots of little parallel lines. And sometimes we can see down here a little stream of very short parallel lines coming off. And as I said, it doesn't take too much imagination to imagine that object, that metal, starting to vibrate a bit and giving off all these little sound waves. 
Now a variation of that, which is sometimes also referred to as ring down, is what we call a comet tail artifact. And this occurs with gas bubbles and also cholesterol crystals. And some people argue that it's due to the bubbles or the crystals vibrating. Other people say it's a slight variant of that and what happens is the sound wave enters that bubble or crystal and it bounces round within it intermittently emitting sound. So if you imagine here, here we have a cholesterol crystal or a gas bubble. The ultrasound beam comes in and it bounces around and every time it sort of bounces back in this direction it sends off a little bit of energy. And what you'll see on the screen from here is a series of closely spaced parallel lines just like the ring down artifact. They tend to die out pretty quickly and so these are referred to as a comet tail. Now this is an example from a gallbladder and here we've got little correct cholesterol crystals in pouches with adenomyosis and we see these little comet tail artifacts. Now in lung ultrasound these comet tail artifacts may be short as very similar to the ones we've just seen in the gallbladder and they're quite normal and they really have no significance. Or they may be long and they may go through the entire depth of the screen. And in that case, they are referred to as either B lines. They're also sometimes known as lung rockets. And in lung, this is thought to be due to reverberation of the sound pulse within the alveolar septa. Here's an example from a lung. This is the pleural surface. It's right up near the top of the chest, so it's curving around. And here we've got these reverberation artifacts running down and they go right to the edge of the screen. In fact, even if we increase the depth, they would continue to, to go all the way through to the edge of the screen. So these are the main artifacts that we're going to see once we start ultrasounding the lung. Okay, so that's all very fascinating, but it is a bit dry and for those whose attention wandered, what do you really need to know out of all that? Well, artifacts cause the appearance is that we use to diagnose both normal lung and abnormal lung. In addition, they determine the limit of what you can and can't see. And finally, there's also some implications for the machine settings. So let's now look at this from the other perspective, that is, from what we see on the screen of the ultrasound machine. And that brings us back to the question we asked before of what causes all that greyness behind the pleural line. And what it is, is it's a mixture of artefacts, including the A lines, the B lines, and the other artefacts that we've mentioned. And so at the pleural surface, what you will get on the screen is a combination of shadowing artefact mirror artifact, reverberation artifact, and sometimes ring down and comet artifact. And so it's very important that you start learning to recognize the appearance of gas, air, any form of gas really, on the ultrasound screen. And one of the things that you'll notice is that the appearance of it sometimes depends on how large the collection of gas is. Is this a tiny bubble or is it a large collection of gas, such as you'll get in the lung. So looking at gas bubbles, these are small, they are bright echogenic dots. They'll often have little comet tails, but because they are smaller than the width of the beam, enough ultrasound energy will get past them so that you won't have a shadowing artifact. Now it is important to learn to recognise gas bubbles in most fields of ultrasound, but particularly in lung. So here is an example, this is lung, and it looks quite different to what we've seen before, and in the later lectures we'll go into this a bit more. But what I want to point out are these bright little areas here and here and here. And these are little gas bubbles. We've got a slightly larger area of gas down here and a slightly larger one here. And this is actually what you see in pneumonia, and these are actually the ultrasound 
features of air bronchograms. But as I said, we'll discuss that a little bit later. At this point, we just want you to look at this and say, that's a gas bubble. Now that's a little bit of gas there, that's a bit of gas there, a little bit of gas there. As we've mentioned before, we have that very strong reflection at air tissue interfaces. And so what this means to us is that the only information we can get from normally aerated lung, or even abnormally aerated lung, but any form of aerated lung, comes from that tissue air interface, generally the pleural line. Everything behind that is actually artifact. And we can use that artifact to give us information of what is happening at that air tissue interface. But we have to remember that we can't diagnose anything that is behind that point because we're not getting any information from it. So that means if you have a pneumothorax and air in the pleural cavity, you can't make any diagnosis of what's actually happening in the lung behind it. Is there pulmonary contusion or not? If you have a pleural surface, you cannot say, is there a solid tumour sitting down in the hilum behind that? Because you're not getting any information from that. And in the setting of, for example, trauma, if you have subcutaneous emphysema, so your air tissue interface is actually more superficial, then you may not get any information from the lung at all, other than what you can infer from the fact if there's subcutaneous emphysema, then there may well be a pneumothorax there, depending on the clinical setting. But as I said, you have to remember that information is coming from that interface and not from any deeper, even though on the screen there might be echoes deeper to that surface. And finally we mentioned that there are implications for machine settings. Why is that? Well, ultrasound machines are actually very clever. Ultrasound manufacturers and designers know that we don't like artefacts, so they've actually got a myriad of very clever techniques to try and reduce artefacts. However, we've just been saying that in lung ultrasound we use those artefacts to make the diagnosis. And in fact, most diagnoses in lung ultrasound are based on artefacts. So if we have a machine that takes all those artefacts away, it may actually make things more difficult. So the implication for you as a user is that you may have to turn off some of those very clever features that the machines use to reduce the artefacts. And in particular, the things that you may have to consider are cross-beam imaging, and we'll talk a little bit more exactly about what that means during the course and the tutorials. We turn off temporal averaging because that will smooth away some of the artefacts and the, the noise that can occur. And some of the noise filters that are used, that the machines use to try and clarify and crisp up the image may again take out some of that information that we want to use for diagnosis. Now fortunately most of the newer machines have a lung preset on them that will do all this for you. But you do have to be careful because sometimes the machine that gives you the beautifully clear smooth image might be great for abdominal imaging but is not actually so good for lung until you change those settings and adjust them. So in conclusion, artefacts always occur in ultrasound. And when we're doing lung ultrasound, you have to remember that the ultrasound image does not necessarily reflect the anatomical reality in the same way as ultrasound of many other areas do. And therefore, rather than being an annoying problem, the artefacts become the basis of diagnosis. Thank you.